Hey, if you would, take your Bibles out or your phones or whatever you guys use, and if you would turn to the book of James, the book of James. Well, when I was a little kid, as early as I could remember, I wanted to grow up, right? When you're a little kid, whether you're a little girl or a little boy, you want to grow up, and there's a lot of reasons why you want to grow up. If you ever think of a reason why you wanted to grow up, do you remember that? Remember when you were little and you wanted to what did, what did you, why did you want to grow up? Why did you want to grow up? Tell the person next to you. Go ahead. Go ahead. You don't have to yell it out. Go ahead. Tell the person next to you. Why did you want to grow up? Anybody want to grow up because you wanted to get a driver's license? Any driver's license people? Okay. Anybody want to grow up and you wanted to drink a beer? Huh? Oh, come on. There you go. There's one. Thank you. Thank you. That's my son. That's not good. He's 16. <laughs> yeah, we'll have a talk later. Anybody uh, you want to grow up because you wanted to have a girlfriend or a boyfriend? Anybody? You want to... No, no. Maybe one or two of you. Yeah, yeah. You want to grow up because you wanted to pick something up. Like you were weak and you'd see your dad pick something up and you wanted to do that. You wanted to, you wanted to do that. There's a lot, of, a lot of reasons. You wanted to vote. Anybody? You wanted to get to that age so you could vote? Anybody? Good. Thank you. Me and you. Yes. 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 I remember that. I was so excited. I voted. I remember the first time I voted, I'll tell you who I voted for, and that's okay. I'm not saying I'm Republican or Democrat. Let's just say I voted for Ronald Reagan, so that kind of gives it away, all right? So I voted for Ronald Reagan. I was so excited to vote for Ronald Reagan, and um, um, arguably, I think, the greatest president that ever lived, but um, back to James. Okay. Um, we look at James. We see this idea of growing up. We see the idea of growing up. It is important to grow up. And when you're younger, it's good to grow up because there's some type of intentionality of wanting to grow up. You were focused on growing up because you wanted to do something. And the reason you want to grow up as it relates to James is a spiritual growing up. There are things that you're going to come across in life, and you can't overcome them being a kid. There are things that... that you need to accomplish, and you have to grow up to accomplish it. And we're going to go through what those things are here in a moment. We're going to talk. We're going to give a kind of an overview. Today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually start a journey with you and James. And before you start a journey, what should you probably do if you're going to start a journey or a trip? probably need to see where you're going, right? Back in the day, you'd pull out a map, right? You'd have a map. We don't do that anymore. Take your phone and Siri, and you hope that Siri gets you to where you're going. So today we're going to have kind of an overview, and we're going to talk a little bit about the journey that we're going to be on in the book of James, because it is a book about spiritual maturity. And James starts out, James 1.1, and that's, that's where we're going to go today, James 1.1, okay? We're going to talk about some other verses, but really James 1.1 is, is really where we're going to, to start and stop. James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. So here's James, just saying, I'm a servant, Jesus is Lord, let's go. That's what he does. Matter of fact, back to my son, I'm going to let you redeem yourself back there, Noah, and I want you to stand up. Would you stand up? All right, I want you to show us your shirt. What does that shirt say? Maybe one of the greatest slogans in all of history. Just do it, right? Just do it. Thank you. You can sit down now. Um, just do it. That's James. James is like, you've been talking about this stuff. We've been talking about this. It's time to get to work. Just do it. We, we sometimes talk too much, and we don't do it. And that's James. And James, in his greeting, if you notice, it's not like Paul. Paul goes on and on and on with these elaborate things, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I love Paul's writing. It's amazing. It's like this one long, run-on sentence. It's amazing. But James is like, I'm a servant, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm talking to you, 12 tribes. Let's go. That's what he says. 
So the person of James is something I want to talk to you about. So as we look at this map and we unfold the map, as you look at it in your phone and we see this journey that we're about to take, I want you to, to look at the person of James. And the term James, the name James, is kind of like our church. There's a lot of people in this church that's named Jim or James, and we have a lot of them. In the New Testament, there were a lot of Jameses, and there were really four that you see in Scripture, and uh, James in the New Testament, very common. Um, but based upon this book, we discover that James is a Palestinian. He's Palestinian, and we know from 1.6 that he was near the sea, sea-driven surf. Verse uh, chapter 3.4, he lived by the sea. We know, uh, based on 3.12, that he lived in a land of oil and figs and wind, and there was this hot wind. So we know that, that we conclude some things just by that. And then when you take the fact that this book was written in about A.D. 46 to 49, somewhere in there, very soon after the crucifixion of Jesus, because of that, but also because it is so late, 46, we can determine that there really is only one James remaining that could have written this book. And this James is the half-brother of Jesus. He's the only one that could, could have done this. And James, based upon being the half-brother of Jesus, you know why he's the half-brother of Jesus? Because Jesus has a father, another father, and that's God. So James is his half-brother, and he's very close to him. And so putting all this together, we know that James here writes this book. And, this, and, and, and as James goes through, and he, and he goes through these years of growing up with Jesus as his half-brother, some things begin to happen. He begins to realize that this Jesus is not just my half-brother. This Jesus is going to live a perfect life. He, he begins to see this growing up. And those of us that have brothers know that our brothers are far from perfect. If you want to prove one thing about Jesus, you want to prove that he is the Son of God, you want to prove that he's resurrected, go look at the half-brother of somebody. You see, James would not have given his life and written the things he's written had Jesus not been who he said he was. No way in the world. You say, well, how do you know that? I have a brother. Some of you have met my brother. He's not perfect. He surely is not the Son of God. But I'll tell you this. If he was, that would be a great, a great point when you're trying to, to talk to somebody about how do you know if Jesus Christ truly is who he said he was. Look at James. James not only saw him live this perfect life, he saw him crucified on a cross. And then Jesus appeared to James. And literally, we see it in Acts that he appears to James. Yes, he appears to the disciples, but it's very clear he appears to James, his half-brother, and nothing can turn a person around like the resurrection of Jesus. The reality is Jesus is resurrected. But the revelation that Jesus Christ is resurrected will change you. It'll take what is here to here. It'll take this, this Palestinian man that believes in head knowledge about Jesus, and then he sees him crucified, and then he sees him face to face. That takes it from here to here. There's a revelation that comes by seeing Jesus. Some of you are here today and you understand Jesus here, but you don't understand him here. He's never given you a revelation of the fact that he is truly alive. But that will change a man. You see, when somebody lives and dies and is resurrected, that should change you. It should at least allow you to look at him and go, maybe what he is saying really is true. Well, James knows this. Not only that, but uh, some believe that he actually did see this This not only the resurrection, but also Jesus go up into heaven. So here's James seeing all this, and then he writes this book. Why is that important for us to know? Because James is in close proximity of Jesus, and not only is this revelation from God that we have in Scripture, but James's perspective is something that is unique from any other person that we see in Scripture. Very unique, so much so that Paul calls James an apostle, and then he even says this about him, that James included with uh, Peter and John is a pillar of the church. We see that in Galatians 2.9. So the book of James, it's made up of only about 108 verses, and we have 54 of those verses that are imperatives. An imperative is what? It's a command. 
So half of the things that we're going to read are not suggestions at all. There is no fluff in this. James is just saying, this is the way it is. And over the next few weeks, maybe even months, it's going to feel that way when we're preaching to you. But I want you to know that I'm not giving you the command. Okay, so it's going to feel that way. It's going to feel heavy. You're going to leave and you're going to be like, wow, it seemed like he was reading my mail. I am not even reading your mail. James was. James is commanding you to do things. There is no maybes to it. So he's telling you this is how it is. James is going to feel like he's going to say to you, I'm done with your talking. It's time for you to walk. It's time for you to walk this out. No more talk. He's wanting to see your commitment. He's not interested in your religious conversations. He could care less about how many amens and brothers you put into your conversation. He wants to know, are you doing it or not? He's not interested in our attendance at church if it's not backed up with our living it out Monday through Saturday. That's how James is. James is concerned about this church being, being more like a workshop for adults rather than kind of a playpen for babies. He's telling us to grow up. And it's a great book for us as a church because we've been doing this for a little while. Yeah, we've been through COVID and we've been, but, but really we started this church. God started this church 2019. And then 2020 we had COVID and if there's something that should grow you up, it'd be COVID, right? And here we are. We're gathered together. We're kind of, we're not in the teen years yet, but we're getting close. We're at that age of kids where we're kind of fourth and fifth grade and you think you know it all. And you may even think that you grew up. But here's the thing. We should be a little bit more grown up than maybe we are. And the only thing that would determine that is each individual person here. A church is made up of people. And so each one of us must look at our own lives and say, am I growing up? I'm seeing some other people that are actually... I accepted Christ 20 years ago, and I saw that person that was baptized two years ago, and it seems like they're a little bit further ahead in their journey than I am. What's going on in my life? It seems like they're talking about how God heard to talk to them, and, and he's walking in faith, and they're moving in faith, and that's not happened in my life. What, what's the deal? So James is speaking to a church that isn't acting their age. And there's a priority of James. The priority of James we see James, a servant of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ, this half-brother of Jesus. He doesn't talk about the blood relationship with Jesus. He doesn't say, James, I'm going to name drop here, guys, the half-brother of Jesus. He doesn't do that. If I was Jesus' half-brother, I would have thrown it in, right? Right? Brian, half-brother of Jesus, just want to throw it in. No, he didn't do that. He says, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus. He doesn't talk about the blood relationship. And why does he do that? Because he's much more interested in Jesus being Lord than he is that he's my half-brother. The lordship of Jesus should change our lives. It changes us. It meets us where we are. If Jesus is Lord, we must stop letting our circumstances defeat us where we are. There is no excuse. So he starts with lordship because if Jesus is Lord, your circumstances really are pretty small compared to that. Wouldn't you agree? If Jesus is Lord and, and you're following him, I'm not saying your circumstances aren't tough. Many of us are going through tough times. I get that. But James is saying if Jesus is Lord, then we must count it all joy. But if, if Jesus is Lord, the things that you're facing in life really must submit to that lordship. We've spent all this time talking about the priority of the values of our church. And so we have God dependence and real relationships and generous living and this kingdom expansion. If all that's true and Jesus Christ is Lord, then let's now look at our lives. If, if Jesus is Lord in your life, you can look at your life and know the question isn't, are you doing your quiet time? The question with each other would be, what did God tell you this morning? If real relationships really do matter, if Jesus Christ is Lord and it's played out in real relationships, then the question isn't, how, are you going to a small group or have you found a small group? The question is, what happened? Did God show up in your small group this week and how did it happen in your life? If, 
If Jesus Christ is Lord in your life, then, then James would say something like, then, then your life needs to be a life of generous living. It, it looks like this. It's not so much, when did you begin to give? No, it's everything belongs to God. And I'm looking for opportunities to give because I can't outgive God. If Jesus Christ is Lord in your life, then we know that it's about expanding the kingdom and it will cost us everything. But when it costs us everything, we get all of God and his everything. So if Jesus Christ is Lord, he starts out this, then our lives look different. You're not waiting for God to help you in the situation you find yourself in. James would say you need to start moving and join God in what he's doing. If, you, if Jesus Christ is Lord, then you don't have to pray for victory in your life. You already have victory, and you just walk from victory. See, there's a difference in how you live your life. The Lord is already working, so you simply join God in what he's doing. So the priority of James, and then we come to the people of James. Who are these people? They're the 12 tribes in the dispersion. 12 tribes represent these 12 tribes uh, of, of Israel that go out, and now they are Jewish Christians, and they go out throughout the world. And so this letter is written in such a way that it is probably something that is actually to a bunch of churches throughout the nations, and they're dispersed. It's not like they were dispersed where they said, hey, where do you want to live, honey? Where do you want to retire? That's not how they're dispersed. It's not like they gathered together and this, you know what, I like the beach, honey, let's move to the beach. No, no, these are, these are people that may have been wealthy at some point, but they have received Jesus Christ as Savior, and they probably are now either poor or poorer than other people, and they are now dispersed throughout the nations, and they probably underwent a lot of persecution at a time, and now they are actually, at some point, kind of now settling in, not as much persecuted, but extremely poor, and they're dispersed out, and, G- and, and James is now writing them, and it talks about this in Acts 9.31. And they are believers for sure. They are Jewish believers. Verse 16 of chapter 1 says, my beloved brothers. Verse 19, my beloved brothers. Um, The Lord brought us forth in verse 18. Dr. Chris Morgan of California Baptist University says this about these people. These churches were Jewish Christians who were working poor. They faced challenges from the outside, oppression from the rich, and turmoil on the inside. Lack of love for the extreme poor, political power plays for leadership roles, disunity, slander against one another, etc. And by the way, there is a lot of etc. They face trials. They face trials. So we're going to talk about trials. Anybody in here right now, you facing a trial? I'm not talking about like going to court, but maybe that's true too. I don't know. Maybe, maybe. Been to court myself? Yeah. Maybe you're going to trial. I'm talking about trials in life. Anybody here going through trials? Trials? Okay. Only a few of you. That's awesome. You guys are awesome. Thank you for being honest. The rest of you, we're going to talk about the sin of lying here in a moment. No. We're but you've been going through, you're going through trials. Thank you for admitting it. We're going through trials. You know, what, you know what James says to trials? Count it all joy. Verse 2. Count it all joy. If you're going through a trial, James has something for you. How about any of you going through a sin? Don't have to raise your hand. You're struggling with sin. There's a temptation that keeps tripping you up over and over again. In verse 13, it says, Let no one that is tempted say he is tempted by God. In other words, James is going to say, You may be going through a trial, but don't get that mixed up with temptation. Don't call your trial you're going through. Don't blame God for that. That's a temptation, and you have failed in that temptation. You have not run from that temptation. You have given in to sin. Don't call it a trial. So he distinguishes between trials and temptations. Don't blame God for your sin. And then when you get in a mess, then blame God for the mess you find yourself in because of your sin. People will do that sometimes. How about financial difficulties? Anybody going through financial difficulties? You're having problems paying bills. You're having problems paying for the gas at the gas pump. Some of you used to fill up your tank, and now it's like half. Sometimes now, and I'm, I'm, there's no joke about this. Some of you aren't even filling it up half. You're filling it up a quarter of a tank just to get to work, and hopefully something will happen there. Maybe you get paid that day. Maybe somebody will give you something. It's taken us, a lot of you, your life has changed dramatically over the last two months. James has something to tell you. 
about financial difficulties and the struggles you might find yourself in. Verse 9 says this, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. Maybe somebody here can't control their temper. There are probably only one or two of you, right? Maybe you deal with an anger issue. Any anger issues out here? Any anger issues? Okay, a couple of you are like, maybe, me, me a little bit, right? These are things you need to internalize. As we look at this map, there are a lot of things that James covers. And get this, I'm not even out of the first chapter yet. He's talking about anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You're getting mad and angry at a lot of people. But ultimately, your anger, flying off the handle, doing the things that you've always done, it's hurting you a lot. It's causing you not to get promoted in life. It's causing you not to stay in that marriage. It's causing you not to have that same relationship. See, James is saying, listen, your anger needs to be controlled because this anger is hurting you. It's hurting others, but it's really hurting you. And here's the thing. Your anger to God, you can get angry to God all you want, but trust me, God isn't going to move because of your anger. At no point is God like standing up and it's like a bully and you're yelling at God and God's like, you know what? You got a point there, buddy. Your anger is causing me to go ahead and shrink back a little bit, and I'll do what you want. The more you're angry at God, the more God just lets you keep going around the same mountain. That's what I found. I met a lot of people who said, at least they're honest, and say, I'm really angry at God. What do you say to that? Okay. You're angry at God? You can stay angry at God, but God is God, and you're not. And so James is just, he's saying, your anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Maybe your issue is looking down at others. James 2, 2 and 3 talks about that. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, listen, my beloved brothers, verse 5, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor, poor man. So maybe you have a view towards this person or that person, a little bit of favoritism based upon classes, and James has something to say to us about that in our heart. Somebody here may be selfish. You think about yourself a lot. You, even before Instagram, there was this idea in the church where it was all about them. Maybe you were, you're dealing with cravings and desires that, that, that only gratify you. James has something to say. If you're, verse uh, 20, 215, if a a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warm and fill without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Some may be dealing with jealousy. Chapter 3, 1 says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. What happened in the church here is as they came to know Jesus and after a few weeks passed and months passed, there were people in the church that were becoming jealous of people that were preaching and singing and doing things in leadership. And they actually became jealous. In other words, they felt like they could be a better pastor than the pastor. And they would actually start actually treating people and acting as if they were pastoring and leading. And James is like, listen... Not many of you should become teachers. My brothers, for you know that those who teach will be judged with greater strictness. In other words, if you want to become a leader in the church, there's a tremendous price that is paid. So be careful about that as you continue to grow up. And then he talks about controlling the tongue. Does anybody ever have a problem controlling their tongue? Right? Some of you just yelled out. Yeah, there you go. Right? That's okay. It's okay to talk at that point. That's a good place to talk. Controlling your tongue. You, you just, you have a problem. The first thing that comes out of your mouth, it just gets you into trouble. And then you apologize for saying something, and then, and then you mess up when you're apologizing because it just keeps coming out, right? It's okay to be quiet. It's okay. There was an old song, You Talk Too Much. I won't go on and elaborate, but there was a, there was a song called that. It, and James actually is saying sometimes our mouth 
gets us into trouble. We react. So if you have a problem with controlling the tongue, it's, look at this verse uh, 2 of chapter 3. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man able to bridle his whole body. In other words, if you can learn the art of staying quiet, this is what James says, that is actually the root of all this. If you could just be quiet and listen to God and do what he says, a lot will change in your life. A lot will change in your marriage. A lot will change in your family. A lot will change in your work environment. Some of you are already really ticked off at me, but we're going to keep going. Okay, here we go. Let's keep going. Worldly Christian. Worldly Christian. Maybe you, you're kind of a Christian, but you're not. By the way, there is no half Christian. But maybe you're kind of those people that say, I like what some things the Bible teaches, but I really like a lot of what the world has to say too on this issue. I I kind of am a natural person, and sometimes I find myself doing natural things, and it's kind of the natural way of going about it. Trust me, we live in a world right now where everything is just kind of flowing downstream, and whatever is progressively moving, just keep going with that because that is a kind of form of religion, a kind of morality. And I want to tell you, there's nothing, nothing that is further from the truth. James says where that comes from. Because some of you are seeing it happen before your eyes. Over the last two years, you have seen your country, you have seen the world completely change, but specifically our country. And you're wondering, all these people are saying, that's just a natural thing. That's a secular thing. That's a progressive thing. That is what we need to do. And James says this, James says this, that it's coming from the pit of hell. He says, it's evil. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above in verse 15 of chapter 3, but it is earthly, unspiritual, and this is what he says, it's demonic. So if you're sensing yourself kind of just going downstream and kind of going with it and not making a big fuss about where our world is going and not standing up and being salt and light, James is saying, if you're wondering where that's coming from, it is not coming from a political system. So don't blame the Democrats or Republicans. It is coming from the pit of hell itself. That's what James says. How about conflict? Have you struggled with any kind of conflict? Do you ever feel like you're not getting along with people? What's the source of the conflict? Chapter 4, verse 1. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? It is not this. That's your passions that are at war within you. In other words, the conflicts that you are facing that you think are the cause of the conflict is not coming from the conflict itself. It's coming from within. The conflict is from within. So he's trying to help us understand that what we're finding ourselves in, we must move out from the conflict that we're in and the circumstances we're in, and we must rise above that. And the only way to rise above that is Jesus Christ himself. And then and only then can we count this all joy. Chapter 4, verse 16, it talks about pride, which has to do with conflict. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. In this church, There were people that were bragging about the house they had or the money they had or the family they had or the job they had or the clothes they wore. And James is saying, that's prideful. You must come into this fellowship. You must come into your small group. You must come into your gathering and submit to God and humble yourself. He says, your life is like a vapor. You think that you're all that, and you think that the world revolves around you, but you need to know something. In a moment, you will be gone, and very few people will remember you. Your life is will come and it will go. So the time that we spend here on earth, we must, we must be glorifying God because God is the only one that is worthy of our worship. God is the only one that is worthy of our attention. To, to focus on ourselves constantly, James says, that is not going to get you anywhere. That is pride. And maybe you're impatient. James 5, 8 and 9 says this, you also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. If you're complaining about somebody, if you're complaining about somebody and the impatience you have, and I'm, by the way, I'm not talking about driving down Sunrise and somebody is driving 20 and it, you can go, you know, 35 and you want to go 45, right? That's not, that's not what he's saying here. This is... This is impatience in your life in such a way that there are people in your life that just don't move fast enough in your life. 
and you're complaining about it and you're guilty. James is saying this, you're as guilty as the person that's causing you impatience. And have you ever found out that when you pray for patience, God is going to give you somebody in your life or a situation to help you with that? So I've learned, you might not want to pray for patience, because he'll, he'll give somebody that will cause you impatience. He will put you behind them. Like, when you're driving down Sunrise and you're behind that person that's going really slow, guess what? Ten minutes ago, you prayed for patience, and he's practicing that. You go to the store, and it's like, great, I'm behind the only person at Bash's that has coupons, right? And you got to wait. And so he wants to give you patience, and he says here, patience is something that's going to be given to you, but do not grumble against one another, brothers, because if you grumble, the Lord's going to be your judge. Maybe you're here today and you're sick. Chapter 5, 14 talks about what you do when you're sick. Call the elders. If you find yourself in a situation where you just, you feel like there's just, maybe it's cancer, maybe it's something else that's going on in your life, call the elders of the church. I love when somebody calls me and says, hey, would you come and would you pray for me? Would you bring some leaders and pray for me? It doesn't happen often, but when it happens, I love doing that because you're actually obeying scripture when it says, call the elders. Very few times have I seen it happen, but I love doing it. And we must pray. 5.16 talks about prayer, and it talks about the, the, the continuation of praying, to continue to pray. And what's the point of James? We'll end here. We come back to where we started, growing up. You see, if, if you grow up and you become spiritually mature, spending time with the Lord, spending time with Him and hearing His voice and spending time with other with other believers and showing love and humility. As you, as you do that and you go through trials and you count it all joy and as you let go of sins that are, that are tripping you up in life, as you continue to look to God to give you patience, to not be angry but to show love, as you continue to do that, you know what happens? You start growing up. And, and get this, it's typically the opposite of what you want to do. You want to tell the person off and God says, no, 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 no. Humble yourself and show love. You know what happens when that happens? You grow up. You start growing up. And James says when you start growing up, you're going to be able to handle things appropriately. And as you get older, those of you that are 15, 16, 17, 18, I want to tell you, there, you I, always, I remember when I was 16, 17, I wanted to grow up. But you know what happens when you grow up? You get grown up problems. Big ones, don't you? Unfortunately, here's what we have. I've seen 50-year-old people that are still kids spiritually. And just because you're 50 or 60 doesn't mean you're grown up enough to handle grown up problems. And so what we have in the world right now, by the way, I'm not sure fully what we have in the world right now. It's a mess. But I can tell you what we have in the world as far as the Christian culture is we have Christians that are not acting any differently than the world. And they're trying to handle issues and use Jesus' name when the reality is you never grew up in your faith. What God's saying through this book is this. It's time to grow up. Problems you will have in life, 16, 17, 18, 19-year-olds, these grown-up problems, here's what James would say to you. Grow up now spiritually so that when you have these problems in life, you can count it all joy. Those of us that are 50, 60, 70 years old that never really grew up, just because we chronologically are older and we still are babes in Christ, the same thing is true to you. It's time to grow up. So James would say the way to grow up is not just taking in information. There is something that happens when you take in the Word of God and then you actually start practicing it, just doing it. You see, to have patience, we must... Have patience. To not talk too much, we need to be quiet. James is just saying, you got to do what you know you're supposed to do. You just need to start doing it. And there is a growing up that happens. And 119 is really the verse of the entire book, I think. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Let every person be quick to hear, Slow to speak, slow to anger. Quick to hear. First and foremost, quick to hear the Word of God. What does God say about this matter? 
quick to hear and run to God, quick to hear and say, God, what do you say? How do I grow up? God, I'm going to go to you, and I want your wisdom. And as I hear your wisdom, God, this is what James is saying, I'm going to consistently, daily, moment by moment, day by day, I'm going to live what you tell me out. I'm not talking about it. I'm hearing you, and I'm going to do it. And by doing that on a regular basis, you will begin to see your life grow up. At no point in this does it say, be quick to speak. It says, quick to hear, slow to speak. Too many, too many of us are quick to speak, and we don't even listen to God at all. And we find ourselves in messes. You know what Job did? Job literally held his hands over his mouth so he wouldn't say anything. Here's somebody that was going through one of the, the, the hardest times of any human being that ever walked the earth, and Job literally put his hands over his mouth because he didn't want to talk. He didn't want God to hear what he, what he was thinking. He's, just put his, he's like, I just want to hear you, God. And God did show up in his life and revealed himself. So, so what we do is we listen to God. We listen to God in our time with him. We listen to God in his word. We listen to God around the word of God. Right now, we're listening to God. And you're hearing a lot of things. And what you do is you're, you're slow right now to speak. You are quick to listen. And you're hearing God's word, quick to hear what he has to say. And then we walk out and we do it. So many of us are finding ourselves in difficult situations. The goal is not to react. The goal is to hear God. In the last year, I've seen numerous people in the midst of tremendous turmoils have their own ideas about how to solve the problems they find themselves in. I've seen people leave jobs only to a few weeks later say, I shouldn't have left that job. I've seen people leave relationships, marriages, only to say, I shouldn't have left that marriage. I've seen people move with a good idea, intention to go somewhere they want to live, only to call me up and say, I made a mistake. I've seen people actually leave churches thinking that leaving a church will help their problem, only to find that the same problem is there, whatever church they go to. You see, they're not listening to God. They're being quick to act, and they miss it all together. And what happens is this perpetuating circle of immaturity instead of growing up. You know, Paul tells us in Ephesians that when we don't grow up, when we don't come into maturity and faith, what happens is we are tossed to and fro by the winds of doctrine, by anything that we hear. We're just tossed around. Like yesterday, we had all these trees and leaves and everything kind of blowing around, and that's kind of what life happens sometimes when we don't really get grounded. And James is saying it's time to grow up, to hear God, to be slow to speak, Slow to hear. This allows us to be Christ-centered, to be slow to speak and to, 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 to not act, but to be Christ-centered. And what happens is when we're Christ-centered and we're hearing God, what he does is he, he gets us involved in a community. I believe James is a community book. It's talking about this community that is fighting with each other and, 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 and just not maturing. And, and James is saying, I want you to hear from God, but... Hear from God, and that consistently, consistency that you have with each other is now going to form this incredible community. And i got to be honest with you. As I read this book, not just Aspire, but the American church in general is so far from what I read sometimes. we got a lot of work to do. we got a lot of work to do. But you know what? I'd rather be a four- or five-year-old group church reading this book than a 45-year-old church and saying, wow, we haven't arrived yet. Hey, we've got an opportunity to grow up. And, and it's okay. You see, when I talk to an 8-year-old, an 8-year-old son or 8-year-old daughter, there's a different tone when I say, hey, I want you to grow up. I want you to learn that. That's different than if I'm talking to a 48-year-old saying, I want you to grow up. It's, it's where we are right now. We're exactly where we need to be. But as you read James... I want you to do what it says. He does not have any fluff in here. There is no, very few of you are going to read a passage in James and go, I have no clue what that's saying. There may be a couple of them, but for the most part, 
You're going to know what it's saying, and you're going to walk away from your quiet time, and you're either going to have to go make that call and ask for forgiveness, or go to that boss and say, would you forgive me for what I did? Or go to that spouse and say, would you, uh, I'm so sorry. We, or go to that person that you played favoritism again. Or maybe make a phone call and say, would you forgive me for the racist comments I made 30 years ago? I can't believe I did that. There's things in our lives that are going to just be laid bare before God. You know, as we end today, we're just going to pray. And we're going to leave. There'll be no more singing. I don't have any more scriptures for you. All I have is a road map and a book called James. And I want you to do something for me. I want you to read it every week. The entire book. Every week, I want you to read the book of James. It's only five chapters. You, you can get through that. Every week, just like we did with Philippians. And I want you to do something for me. I want you to do what it says. I believe at the end of this book, marriages will be restored. People that talk too much won't talk too much anymore. We won't react anymore, but we'll respond in the spirit. I believe your, your workplace environment will be better. I believe many of you will hold down jobs more than you ever have before. I believe your money will actually begin to flourish and come out of the woodwork because you will be giving, giving away. And guess what? You will never outgive God. There will be things that will happen in your life if you will do what the Word says. And what it'll do is it'll take you from this hard-hearted person or divided heart to a life that is fruitful because your fruitful heart will take this in and the Word of God will be applied and you will just do it. And when you just do it, God will show up and the Holy Spirit will activate things in your life that you've never seen possible because you're obeying. You know what allows the Holy Spirit to really work in your life? Obedience. Obedience. Just doing it.